الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد. So we are winding down إن شاء الله. Um, I hope to finish up the rest of the Sahaba that we will be doing within four or five weeks, and then after uh, the break we will start off with the Ummahat and Mu'minin, the mothers of the believers, إن شاء الله تعالى. And then that will take us basically, إن شاء الله, uh, to uh, the end, إن شاء الله, the finale, إن شاء الله تعالى. Uh, I'm always having issues every week which Sahabi to do. Why? Because now we're getting to the Sahaba who don't have detailed biographies. And if we wanted to spend the next five, ten years doing one paragraph of some of the Sahaba, we could do that. Because now we're coming to uh, so many of the Sahaba that are not, uh, we only have tidbits about them. And there's useful information as well about them. So what I've decided to do is really to choose those that we have some more information about or some stories that are very, very interesting uh, about them. And today, inshallah ta'ala, I wanted to do a Sahabi who has a lot of interesting tidbits and anecdotes. And he is one of the uh, enemies of early Islam. And then he becomes one of the Sahaba. And there are a few of them uh, who basically, I call them the noble enemies. There are a few of the Sahaba, I call them the noble enemies. That at one point in their lives, they were noble enemies, i.e., even though they opposed Islam, the way that they opposed it, by and large, they did not stoop to the level of Abu Jahl. They did not stoop to the level of uh, al walid ibn Uqba and others of their character. They opposed the Prophet ﷺ from some level of sincerity, not based on arrogance. And this is another difference that Abu Jahl, for example, he knew Islam was true at some level, and yet he opposed it. But by and large, there was a group who they didn't really... Uh, believe uh, that Islam was true. They believed that their religion was true. And they opposed the Prophet some quote-unquote, sincerely. And one of the examples that we're going to do today, inshallah, I will do another example, if not next week, the week after that. But one of the examples is that of Suhail ibn Amr. Suhail ibn Amr. And Suhail ibn Amr is one of those characters that, subhanAllah, you see snips, uh, snippets of him throughout the seerah. And it is Allah's blessing. If he were to be taken at any time earlier, he would be a person of Jahannam. But Allah Azza wa had a plan for him. And Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala wanted him to play a role. And he played a very interesting role as we shall uh, see today, insha'Allah Ta'ala. Suhail ibn Amr, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal said, I heard Imam al-Shafi'i say, Suhail was a praiseworthy Muslim from the moment he embraced Islam. I found this quote interesting that Imam Ahmad who was a student of Imam Shafi'i, they are commenting on this Sahabi, and he is not one of the famous Sahabi, he's one of the lesser Sahaba. And Imam Shafi'i commented, Suhail, ever since he embraced Islam, he was praiseworthy. He did a very good job from the moment that he converted. So who is this Suhail ibn Amr, and what can we benefit from him? Suhail was from one of the distant tribes of the Banu Hashim. If you remember the Quraysh, now how many tribes did the Quraysh have? Uh, even I don't know off the top of my head but around at least 20 to 25 tribes within the Quraysh of Mecca. So around 20 tribes within the sub-tribes of the Quraysh. And obviously the Banu Hashim and the Banu Makhzum, these are the two main ones, right? And uh, the, the uh, if you call the Banu Umayya, you can say these three. So the Banu Makhzum is Abu Jahl, the Banu Umayya is uh, Abu Sufyan, right? And then the Banu Hashim is our Prophet Sassim. These three are the central tribes, the big ones, the ones that carry the weight. Far, far away, you have so many other tribes. One of them that we really haven't discussed because it's so far away, but they are from the people of Mecca and they are from the Quraysh, is the tribe of Suhail ibn Amr. It's one of the sub-tribes of Suhail ibn Amr and it is called the tribe of Banu Amir ibn Lu'ay. And Lu'ay, this Lu'ay is the eighth grandfather of the Prophet ﷺ. So him and the Prophet ﷺ, they convene after eight generations. So that's a pretty distant time away. Eight generations they convene together. Suhail ibn Amr, when Islam came, we don't know exactly how old he was, but we can assume we can assume he was slightly older or a decade older than the Prophet. Why? Because he had already established his seniority. He's already in the council of elders, the MP, the senator. He's already somebody who is represented uh, in the Nadwa council. So he's a senior member 
of the overall delegations of the Quraysh, and he was given a title, even pre-Islam, he was called the Khatib of the Quraysh, Khatib al-Quraysh. Khatib al-Quraysh here doesn't mean he's giving the Friday khutbas, Khatib here means he is the orator. So he is not a poet, he is an orator. He can give a khutbah, i.e. he can move you with his speech. He knows how to give a speech that's going to mesmerize you. So he was known as the most eloquent of the Quraysh, the Khatib of the Quraysh. And from the seerah and from the books of the seerah, we learn that he had at least four children, two sons and two daughters are mentioned, and at least three brothers. And we know this because his three brothers, all of them, were from the earliest batch of converts unlike him. He did not convert till the very end. And his three brothers actually converted even before, at least two of them converted even before Darul Arqam had opened. So they're of the first 40 converts, the very earliest of batches. And their names were Sulayt and Sakran and Hatib ibn Amr. So you have Suhail ibn Amr, Sulayt, Sakran and Hatim. And these three are of the earliest of batches. And all of them, or maybe two of them, and again, all three of them, we don't know anything about other than a brief mention here and there. Uh, they migrated to Abyssinia and they came back and they migrated to Medina and they participated in Badr. And yet, for some reason, we don't have many stories about these three brothers. But the, the, the family, their, their family basically converted other than Suhail ibn Amr. Now, one of his brothers was Sakran. Uh, Sakran's wife, was Sauda binti Zum'a, who is our mother, Sauda binti Zum'a. Sakran's wife was Sauda, and they migrated to Abyssinia. He passed away in Abyssinia, and then Sauda becomes a widow. And after the death of Khadija, for by one year, or some say two years, we'll get to that one year, inshallah, we'll get to that story. Uh, after the death of Khadija for one year, the process was not uh, uh, single, was not married, and then, um, Khawala suggested to him, why don't you marry? So he said, who do you have in mind? So she said, I have in mind uh, a widowed lady and a young lady, unmarried lady. As for the widow, it is Sauda. And as for the young lady, it is Aisha. And so Aisha was too young to actually marry. So that was happened in, in, uh, in Medina. But Sauda was the uh, uh, mother that uh, he married, our mother that he married. And this Sauda was essentially the sister-in-law of Suhail ibn Amr. Okay, and uh, the Sauda was at that time obviously the sister-in-law, and the person who gave Sauda away, the the, the wali of Sauda, because again the Muslim community was small, was another brother of Suhail, and so the brother of his wife, basically the, the his uh, her brother-in-law, and that is Hatib. So Hatib and Sakran both migrated to Abyssinia. Sakran dies. Hatib becomes the wali because it's his brother's wife. So he's the one who gave Sauda in marriage to the Prophet wasallam. All of this is happening from the family of Suhail indirectly. Obviously, this is Suhail's um, brothers. Along with these three brothers, Suhail had two sons and two daughters. The two sons, the eldest one is Abdullah ibn Suhail, and the second son is Abu Jandal ibn Suhail. And both of them play a prominent role in the seerah. As for Abdullah ibn Suhail, he converted along with his uncle. So it's interesting to note, look at how many converts from that family. And he migrated to Abyssinia along with his uncles. When they returned from Abyssinia, Suhail imprisoned his son Abdullah. So Abdullah becomes a prisoner because he converted to Islam. And Suhail commanded that his servants, his slaves, basically torture his son, Abdullah, to renounce Islam. So he was locked in the house, he was chained in the house, and then he was tortured. So Suhail is indicating the anger. It's clearly something that is definitely not commendable that he's done, but he is torturing his children, his son, in order to renounce the faith. Abdullah eventually outwardly renounces, and he pretends to come back to shirk. Okay, but it's pretending. His father thinks he's back, but as we know, there's a concession given, and he takes this concession. And so he returns back to uh, and basically leaving outwardly the practicing of Islam. And uh, so Suhail therefore believes that his sons are now, uh, both of them are non-Muslims. His other son, Abu Jandal, at some point in time converts. We do not know when, but this is a secret conversion. So clearly, 
the elder brother is giving da'wah to the younger brother. Eventually, the younger one also converts, but Suhail does not know. Suhail ibn Amr, his name comes up many times in the seerah. And of the prominent times that shows you who he is and shows you his status, is when the Prophet ﷺ returned from Ta'if. And by the way, his name does not come up under any persecution of any other person other than his children. Now, it's not good he persecuted his children, yet at the same time, an excuse can be found that this is his children, and he is very hurt that they are leaving his faith, and he wants to protect his faith. So, the authority of the father over the son is not like the authority of two people in the city. So Suhail did not persecute anybody else. And in fact, he never participated from what we, what we can tell in any type of mocking of the Muslims, in any type of derogatory comments against the Muslims. And as I said, that's why we call him a noble uh, enemy. So he's an enemy where you see a sense of nobility. He's not stooping to the level of Abu Jahl. So the next time his name comes up is in the story of Ta'if. When the Prophet ﷺ comes back from uh, Ta'if, and if you remember at that time, Abu Talib had already passed away. Abu Lahab had taken over the charge of the Banu Hashim. And Abu Lahab initially had a soft spot at this time, if you remember. And he said, because Abu Talib had given him the wasiyah, take care of you know, your nephew, you're in charge of him now. He is our tribe, our blood, our kinsman. So for a few weeks or days, Abu uh, Lahab agreed to allow the process him to continue like his older brother Abu Talib had done. But then an incident happened and Abu Lahab immediately returned back to his old self and said, I have nothing to do with you. You are cut off now from the Banu Hashim. So the Prophet is now left without a sponsor as we know. And that is why he went to Ta'if. Remember the whole story, that's why he went to Ta'if. Now that he comes back from Ta'if after what happened, happened, Bilal said, how will you enter Mecca, Ya Rasulullah? How will you enter Mecca? Now, we don't have the, the permission, you know, the visa, as I say, that when I gave the seerah. You don't have the stamp to get in now. You don't have the protection. And this meant if Abu Lahab had taken away the protection, what this means is that if anybody harms the Prophet ﷺ, there's nobody that's going to do anything now. The Quraysh have now washed their hands, right? There's no, again, law and order was based upon tribe. And... Abu Lahab had taken away that privilege. So the, the Prophet ﷺ said to Bilal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make a way out for us. And he sent Bilal to Al-Akhnas ibn Shuraiq, one of the leaders of uh, Mecca at the time. And Al-Akhnas gave an excuse and he said, I am a Halif and the Halif la yujar. So the Halif means, Al-Akhnas basically said, I'm not a pure Qurashi. Okay? Basically, you can say, so the, the, the system of Jahiliyyah was, the system of Jahiliyyah was that anybody of the senior members of the Quraysh can, or, or, or of any tribe, can give protection, can grant the visa, okay? And this is a matter of culture and custom. Who is a senior member? It, they, they know amongst themselves. And the Prophet knew that Al-Akhnas is not a Qurashi, but Al-Akhnas was a nobleman of his tribe. And if Al-Akhnas wanted to, he could have given protection from his tribe. But he gave an excuse. He goes, look, I'm not a Qurashi. You know, I'm a Halif. You know, I'm uh, basically, you can say I have a green card. Okay, I mean, I'm just giving equivalent. So I can't give you a green card. Okay, so in those days, uh, you had to have the status to basically give the status. He did have the status, but not from the Quraysh. So he found a way out. He said, Khalas, I'm not going to give you anything. Okay, then the second person, the Prophet sent Bilal to was Suhail ibn Amr. So, moving down now, Suhail, now Suhail is a Qurashi. Suhail is a Qurashi by blood. Go back to seven generations and they meet. But Suhail, now the fact that the Prophet sends Bilal to Suhail indicates what? Some nobility, what else? Status. Status, of course, that he's giving the protection, what else? He's strong enough to protect. Strong enough to protect status, but there's, you're getting, there's something else. Aha. The fact, now, did the Prophet send something to Abu Lahab? No. He knows Abu, Lahab, Abu Jahl. Did he send a messenger to Abu Jahl? No. Why did he send a messenger or Bilal? Why did he send him to Suhail? Because there is a little bit of friendliness. 
a little bit of, you know what, maybe, maybe Suhail will help me now that I need his help, right? This is what I'm trying to get at here, that Suhail and the Prophet there's already a little bit of like, he feels confident enough, okay, let me try Suhail, okay? And Suhail was pure Qurashi. He wasn't the first choice, he was the second. And Suhail politely said no. And what was his excuse? Again, he had to give an excuse. And again, the fact that he gave an excuse, even if it's a weak one, giving an excuse is better than rejecting and mocking, right? And if somebody comes and asks you for money, and say, Allah, I really wish I could help you, but right now is just a bad time. You know, you give an excuse rather than saying, yeah, whatever, you know, big difference between the two, right? So Suhail gave an excuse. What was his excuse? He said, I am from the Banu Amir, and you are from the Banu Ka'ab, the two brothers, yani Ka'ab ibn Lu'ay, Lu'amir ibn Lu'ay. The process is Ka'ab ibn Lu'ay, and he is Amir ibn Lu'ay. So the two brothers, seven generations back. And he goes, it is well known that the Banu Amir cannot protect the Banu Ka'ab. Okay, meaning that we are not as superior to you guys. Like he's basically saying we are inferior, and your tribe status is higher, so I really don't have the, the authority. Even though, again, he did if he wanted to. Right? Again, he did, but it's just a matter of weaseling your way out. Okay? So Suhail also says no. And then who did the Prophet send Bilal to? Who remembers? Mut'im ibn Adi, the noblest of all of the kuffar. The noblest of all of the kuffar. Mut'im ibn Adi. And if I were to give any lecture about a non-Sahabi, I would give about him. But I have given a lecture in other uh, seminars and other places about Mutab ibn Adi and I've called it the legacy of a kafir it's online actually I went over the story of Mutab ibn Adi in detail and um, it's a very very interesting story uh, Mutab ibn Adi was the third choice and he's the one hit the jackpot Mut'im was the noblest of the kuffar at that time and he's the one who personally went and protected the Prophet Sallallahu armed himself and his own children his own sons and he guarded the process with his own body and his children's bodies and that's a very big deal and he then said I have given protection and Abu Jahl was shocked and Abu Jahl said are you a follower of his or is he a protected protectorate of you in other words are you a Muslim or are you just acting like a tribal leader and here is, of course, the beauty. If he had said, I'm a Muslim, and he wasn't a Muslim, he died a kafir, then Abu Jahl would not have accepted. He goes, no, I am just giving him my protection. So he said, okay, in that case, we have to give protection to those whom we give protection. And that was the uh, protection that the Prophet lived with for the next year and a half until the migration occurred to um, Medina. Okay, so that was Mutam ibn Adi. But the fact that Suhail was his second choice is what we are interested here. The next reference of Suhail is the Battle of Badr. And Suhail goes with his son Abdullah to the battle of Badr. And along with Abdullah is Abdullah's Halif, the one that we just mentioned, the, giving the visa. So Abdullah had given a visa to somebody and uh, his name was Sa'd ibn Khawala. And Abdullah's slave and his name was Umair. So Abdullah and three people, there are three people with him. And when they camp before the battle of Badr and the two armies are facing one another, Suhail wakes up to discover all three of the people with him in the tent have disappeared. Okay, so Abdullah and his best friend and his slave have done what? Defected to the right side. They have disappeared and defected to the right side. And this indicates so many things. Abdullah clearly, even though the books don't mention this, but we interpret, he must have been active in giving da'wah secretly. And he was successful. That he has converted three people and they're all migrating to Medina to, uh, to the battle of Badr basically and fighting with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and this Abdullah Abdullah Ibn Suhail he participated in all of the battles including the Hudaybiyah Treaty which we're going to come to and the conquest of Mecca and he eventually dies a Shaheed and Abdullah is one of the very few people, I, th I, th I want to say there's at least two more, but don't quote me on that, very few, two, two people, and he's one of them, who are counted as Badri Sahaba, even though they left Mecca and not Medina. Okay, Badri Sahaba are the highest level of Sahaba after the 10. If you remember, we did all of this many times. 
after the 10, the highest level is Badri Sahaba. And all, all of the Badri Sahaba are based in Medina. There's two, maybe three, but two who are actually from Mecca and they are Badri Sahaba. And number one on the list is Abdullah ibn Suhail. He left Mecca in the army of the Quraysh and yet he is a Badri because he defected the night before. Okay? Of course, this was planned. He didn't convert the night before. He had never returned to Kufr, obviously. He's never knew he's going to return to Kufr. So he uh, is considered to be of the Badriyun, even though he left Mecca along with the uh, uh, Quraysh. And in the Battle of Badr, as you know, 70 of the Quraysh die, and 70 are taken hostage or captured. And Suhail ibn Amr was the one who captured was was captured amongst the seventy prisoners. So Suhail was of those who was captured, and one of the Ansar Malik ibn Dukhshum was the one who captured him. And Malik ibn Dukhshum was so happy that he captured Suhail that he composed poetry, and it is recorded in Ibn Hisham. And the first line of it, the translation of it, is, "I have captured Suhail, and I have no need of any other prisoner in the world besides him." In other words, now that I captured Suhail, I am the happiest person in the world. This one prisoner does the job of the whole world for me. So again, this demonstrates the status of Suhail, that uh, Malik was so uh, ecstatic to have captured just Suhail. Suhail also was one of those who saw the angels at Badr. And this indicates something, because the angels do not show themselves unless Allah wants them to show themselves to those whom He chooses. So not everybody saw the angels, by the way. Not everybody saw the angels at Badr. And Suhail was one of those who saw the angels. And Suhail said that I saw in the battle of Badr men in white robes riding black and white horses. So horses that were pure black with streaks of white. And in midair hovering. And they were with banners. And they were fighting and taking prisoners. So Suhail saw the angels in the battle of uh, Badr. When he was captured as a prisoner, Umar ibn Khattab requested that his mouth be mutilated. Why? Because Suhail was the most eloquent. And he was at that time active in, basically, he was one of those who was preaching in the Battle of Badr. You know, like when you're doing your pep talks, of the, you know, when you're inciting the army. You know, the, 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 the generals, they do that, right? So Suhail was one of those who's with his eloquence, he is helping them. And uh, Umar ibn Khattab said, Ya Rasulullah, let me take his teeth out so that he will never feel free to uh, use his tongue against us, okay? Uh, they say that Suhail had type of lisp or something, so if the teeth were removed, then he would not be able to speak. Something like this to do with that, because you would say, why would the teeth affect the, 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 the speech? But Suhail had some type of issue where the teeth was needed for him to speak. Uh, so uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I will not mutilate him. For if I do, Allah might mutilate me even if I am a prophet. Meaning, mutilation is haram in Islam. And if you mutilate, then you will be punished. And he's saying, if I do it, even if I'm a prophet, it will be done back to me. So I forbid mutilation. And our process of forbid mutilation, as you know, it is haram in the sharia to do that. And then he said, leave his teeth, O Umar. Allah, perhaps someday his speech will make you happy. Okay? This is a prediction. Let him, perhaps one day, you were irritated at his speech, one day you will be happy at his speech. And we will see when that will happen. So, uh, one of his tribesmen came from Mecca to ransom him off. His name was Mikraz. And uh, they negotiated the uh, price, and Mikraz did not have the full amount with him. So instead of going back, Mikra said, keep me and let Suhail go free and I will be your hostage until Suhail sends the remainder of the money back here. And so that's exactly what uh, his captor did, that the captor then took Mikra's as the hostage and Suhail went back to the Quraysh and then sent the remainder of the money and Mikra's then versified, I, I mortgaged myself even though money is easier for me that Suhail, who is the best of us, can go back to our sons and so that we may fulfill our hopes through him. It's a poetry, I'm just translating into English. That I could have given money, and I could have, but I wanted the dignity and the honor of substituting for Suhail. So a non-Muslim, Mikras, is saying, 
it's my honor that I am the one who is now being put as the hostage in place of Suhail. And I want Suhail to go back and cheer our tribe up. So again, this demonstrates the status of Suhail, that uh, he was so much respected by the Quraysh. And uh, Abu Jandal, of course, is still in Mecca. Now, why did Abu Jandal not participate in Badr? I have not found out from the books of Sirah. Why was Abu Jandal not at Badr? I do not think it was because he was too young, but that is a possibility. It's a possibility that Abu Jandal might have been 13, 14 or something. We don't know. But because we don't know, the ages are not mentioned. Again, these are those Sahaba. We don't have dates of, death, of birth of any of them. Suhail and his two sons, we don't know when they were born. It is a possibility that Abu Jandal was maybe 13 years old or something, such that when Hudaybiyah happens, so now he is Balagh. And it is a possibility that was a legitimate excuse and Abu Jandal is not participating. Abu Jandal was not at Badr. His older brother Abdullah was in Badr. Okay, so the next incident that is mentioned, we fast forward, and that is the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. So for four years, Suhail's name is simply not mentioned. And therefore, it appears that he did not participate in Uhud, and he did not participate in any other major incident. It appears that he's now, you know, um, living his own life. Again, he's not one of the worst enemies. He did things that were definitely very bad, and we're going to come to some of them, but he's not one of the worst enemies of Islam at this time. And the next major incident that um, uh, is played is that of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, and of course is one of my favorite incidents. I've talked about this, I think, in four or five lessons we did. I'll just quickly mention some of the main stories from that treaty. The Treaty of Hudaybiyah, of course, take place in which year, guys? Everybody should know. This is basic stuff. Which year? No, that's Mecca, conquest of Mecca. Sixth year. Hudaybiyah is sixth of the Hijrah. Eighth is conquest of Mecca. So the sixth year of the Hijrah is when Hudaybiyah takes place. And if you remember, the whole conundrum of Hudaybiyah was that the Prophet ﷺ had never gone back to Mecca as a pilgrim. And the laws of Mecca were very clear from the time of Ibrahim. No one is denied access to the Haram even if we are at war with them. And that is why in the months of Haram, right, Ashur al Hurum, in the months of Haram, the four months, right, in those four months, even the enemies of the Quraysh can come and do Umrah or do Hajj, right? That's the whole point of the Ashur al Hurum, by the way. That's one of the main points. And this was in the days of Jahiliyyah. So the Prophet has never taken advantage of this. And this is the first time that he's going to test the waters. And so in the sixth year of the Hijrah, 1,400 of the Sahaba, they abandon their armor and they do not have their fighting weaponry that they would typically have. And they march in Ihram with their animals of Hadi. And again, this is a big risk, but Allah had shown that it's going to happen. And so they went on this way and the Quraysh completely panicked. They had no idea what to do because obviously... Now what do we do? What do you, this is a very big problem for them. And they uh, sent a, a force to stop the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ heard about that and he waylaid them and he basically camped at Hudaybiyah, which is right outside of the city of Mecca. And if you go to, um, if you go these days to Hudaybiyah, it's like a 20 minute drive, you know, and you, and, you will, and you will literally, if you're going to Medina, there'll be a sign that says Hudaybiyah exit. And if you go there, 10 minutes, you'll get there. So it's a very short distance outside. That's where the Prophet ﷺ camped. So the, he camped over there, and this was when the Quraysh sent multiple uh, emissaries, right? Multiple envoys, one after the other. Ibn Hisham mentions three or four, and some books of Sirah mention six or seven came, one after the other, one after the other, and each one ended up in failure. Every one of them ended in failure. And the stalemate becomes longer. And Uthman ibn Affan is delayed. And the Treaty of Ridwan or the Bay'at al-Ridwan takes place. All of this is taking place until finally the Quraysh decide we now need to send the negotiator. And who do they choose? Suhail ibn Amr. So again, we get to now the status of Suhail. When all of the other emissaries fail one after the other, they need to choose an eloquent leader whom they trust to safeguard the interests of the Quraysh. And so they send Suhail ibn Amr and they say, whatever conditions you give him, the one condition that must be there is, what is the one condition the Quraysh said? 
nothing this year. Next year you can come. This year you are not allowed to come so that the Arabs not say that the Muslims were able to come in. We have the upper hand. That's the one condition we have. The rest, up to you. We can give you some leeway. Okay, that was the one condition. And so this is when Suhail came uh, as the appointed emissary. And when the Prophet ﷺ saw Suhail, he cheered up. And this is another sign as well of the status of Suhail. He was happy and optimistic, and he derived a positive omen from the name Suhail. And he said, قَدْ جَاءَ Suhail, That Suhail has come. سَهُلَ عَلَيْكُمْ أَمْرُكُمْ Your affairs have now been made easy. Because Suhail means the easy one, the gentle one. And Sahil is easy. Suhail is the gentle one, the easy one. So he derived a positive omen from the name of Suhail. That this is the easy one. Now your matter will become easy for you. And so Suhail ibn Amr uh, came, and this was when um, they finally agreed. And uh, Suhail and, and uh, the Prophet called Ali ibn Abi Talib, and he said, okay, write down what we have agreed. So after, I'm obviously making this very short because I went over this in a lot of detail in the seerah. You can look it up. And the verbal agreements that they had done between the Prophet and Suhail, now they're going to write them down. And this was when uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib was taken as the scribe, and the Prophet said, write down, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And Suhail said, no, I don't know this phrase. Rather, write it the way we used to write it. Bismik Allahum. So the Prophet said, okay, fine, write Bismik Allahum. Then he said, write down, this is what Muhammad Rasulullah has agreed with Suhail ibn Amr. And Suhail said that if I thought you were Rasulullah, I would not be fighting you now, or I would not be stopping you now. Okay? Delete this Rasulullah. And this is one, of course, the famous thing that Ali and the Prophet, they both said no. I mean, uh, sorry, Ali said, I'm not going to delete it. And so the Prophet himself uh, erased it. And he said, I am Rasulullah, even if you say, even if you refuse to acknowledge it. So this is what Muhammad ibn Abdullah وسلم, agreed to with Suhail ibn Amr. So his name is in the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. So his name is in the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. And they, and they write down, that we shall uh, agree to stop any fighting between us for 10 years. And for 10 years, there shall be peace and security between us. And then the conditions go on and on. And then they get to that famous phrase where uh, whoever, uh, where, uh, whoever wants to enter into a peace treaty with the Muslims can do so. And whoever wants to enter into a peace treaty with the uh, Quraysh, they can uh, do so. When they, had write, when they were writing this phrase down, that was when the famous incident took place of Abu Jandal, the other son of Suhail and the brother of Abdullah. Now, subhanAllah, there's one of those weird scenes, really bizarre scenes. Abdullah ibn Suhail is in the delegation of Muslims. Suhail is the emissary. And now Abu Jandal, the other son, comes from, the, from Mecca. What a bizarre story, right? One son on this side, one son coming from that side, and the one person who is the emissary, he is the, uh, you know, the father of the both of them. And Abu Jandal had been chained up and been deprived of food and water and been beaten by the slaves. Again, the same thing that he had done with his older uh, brother. Now, when Abu Jandal heard that the Muslims are in Hudaybiyah, he managed to take off the chains from the wall, but his hands were still in the chains. His hands were still in the chains. And he came to the Muslim camp as his own father, Suhail. And ironically, he would not have known that the Quraysh have chosen Suhail. This is all from Allah's Qadr, right? And imagine again Allah's Qadr that the, every book of Sirah says the same thing, that as soon as they finished writing this phrase, right, that was when Abu Jandal appears from the horizon. I mean, if this is not Allah's Qadr, then what is, right? This, the, the, the setup is divine. You cannot create this scenario. It is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Abu Jandal sees the Muslims, and then Ibn Hisham has a really moving paragraph. It's actually very, very uh, painful. Ibn Hisham goes into a tangent here, and he says that the Sahaba of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, their spirits were high. They believed in the dream of the Prophet Sallallahu and they were certain that they would be doing tawaf that year. So their spirits were very high. But now when they realize that they're going to be going back, what happens? 
the whole mood has been there there's there's depression there's sadness there's what not and this was almost about to destroy them and then at that point in time they saw abu jandal the son of suhail with the wounds and the blood and the chains coming in like the melodramatic scenario is unbelievable that they're already hurt and they're in grief and they're in anger and they're in shock and now to make matters worse Abu Jandal is I can't say the icing on the cake is the opposite right is the camel that or the straw that's breaking the camel's back and when Suhail saw his son coming he stood up and smacked him across the face his own son and held on to his chains because the chains were still there and he said oh Muhammad this incident or this uh, this clause right here this is going to be the first you know exception here now or the first you know person that is going to be applied to that no one from the Quraysh is going to migrate to Medina and if any from Medina come to Mecca, then they are welcome. Now, this clause was invented off of thin air because of Abu Jandal. See, this is all from Allah's Qadr. This clause was not in the treaty. It would not have been in the treaty. It has nothing. They didn't. It wasn't mentioned. But now that Suhail sees his son, he's already lost one son. All of his brothers are already over there. This is his last son now. And he is going to die before he lets that son go. Right? So he says, add that to the, to the treaty. And the Prophet said, we have not agreed to this. That's not a part of what we had spoken about. But see, and this is Allah's qadr again. Had it been any other person, neither would Suhail have caused an issue, right? Nor would it have been put in the treaty. No big deal. Like, okay. But it's his son and it's his last son. And Suhail threatened to revoke the whole treaty unless this clause is added. And the Prophet ﷺ went back and forth, back and forth. Okay, we will have the clause, but give this one to me. But see, that's the one that Abu Jandal Suhail would never allow, right? And some scholars mention that never did the Prophet ﷺ go back and forth. I don't want to use the word begging because it's not appropriate. But never did he plead so earnestly as much as he did for this one person. But who is he pleading with? The father of the person. Right? What's going to happen here? Impasse is not going to happen. And so the Prophet ﷺ felt there is nothing for him to do other than to agree. And this was when Umar radiallahu an. That's the whole story there. That was just too much to bear. Too much to bear. You, you know what happened with Umar radiallahu anhu. There's one of those awkward things again, Yani. Uh, it needs to, in the seerah we mentioned it. No need to mention all of it over here. But again, the emotional, like the, the whole story is just so emotionally charged at this point in time. And Umar radiallahu anhu, after he did what he did, then he stands up and he walks towards Abu Jandal. Like literally, while the treaty is still being going on. And he says to Abu Jandal, Be patient, O Abu Jandal. These people anyway, they're mushrikun. And their blood is not worth the blood of a kalb. What's the big deal, right? And he points to his sword. Because the muhrim is allowed a traveler's sword. They had two types of swords. The fighting sword and the traveler's sword. The traveler's sword is to protect yourself against animals or something like this. And he points to his sword, Abu Jandal. It's like he's saying, and if you want, you can take it. Because he don't, doesn't want to hand it to him. right? So he points to his sword, meaning take the sword and be done with it. You know, the, I, I can't do it, but you uh, can do it here. But um, his father then pulled him back and, uh, and Abu Jandal was not... I mean, we do not know if he would have even done it or not, but basically uh, that did not um, happen. And so because of this, uh, of course, uh, Abu Jandal was returned back to Mecca. And as he's being returned, Abu Jandal shouts out to the Muslims. And uh, he says that, uh, will you return me back to Kufr and you see what they have done to me? And the athar of the torture were clear on his body. I mean, it's such an emotional moment here. 
right? And it's his own father dragging the chains back. And the Prophet wasallam said, Allah will make a way out for you. And what else can I do? Allah will make a way out for you. And this really obviously hurt uh, the Muslims psychologically. And the battle, uh, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah is definitely one of the most interesting uh, incidents of the seerah that especially in our times we need to think about over and over again because of all of the benefits. Of course, what happened after that, as you know, briefly to get back to Suhail, but what happened after that, this clause was necessary because there were too many Muslims in Mecca that were secret, hidden Muslims. And what happened was the famous story of another uh, person, uh, Abu Jandal's friend, Abu Basir. Okay, Abu Jandal had a friend, Abu Basir. And Abu Basir escaped from his chains and migrated to Medina after Hudaybiyah. Okay? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Oh Abu Basir, you know, you know the treaty we did. Abu Basir said, I am aware, Ya Rasulullah, but you didn't. I'm just here. I mean, I came of my own. You didn't call me. So he allowed Abu Basir to remain. But then two delegates came from the Quraysh. And they said, the treaty. Abu Basir is here. And it's our treaty that we have to take him back. So Abu Basir said, Ya Rasulullah, you didn't call me. He's like literally begging and it's very painful again. You didn't call me. I just came. Do you expect me to go back to the Quraysh now? And the Prophet ﷺ said that, Oh Abu Basir, Allah will make a way out for you. But we have a treaty and we do not betray our treaties. We do not betray our treaties. Ghadar, which is betrayal khiyana, is not allowed. And so, uh, and he said, Allah will make a way out for you. And so Abu Basir then uh, was forced to go back. He was, and again, wallahi, imagine the iman of these people. Imagine their iman. Abu Basir, Abu Jandal, the Prophet himself says, go back. What, what a test of faith that is, right? And they have to really, so Abu Basir then goes back, manages to escape and kill one of the slayers, as you know, and he runs back to Medina again. And he says, Ya Rasulullah, you sent me with them. Now I escaped. Now can I stay now? I mean, twice he's asking. Twice, can you imagine? And the Prophet ﷺ said, he, 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 um, because the other man came running back and saying that, you know, Abu Basir killed my companion, you agreed to send him back. Now the Prophet ﷺ did not agree to escort Abu Basir. That's not my responsibility. That's your responsibility, right? My responsibility is like he cannot live here. But I don't have to put him in chains and hand him to you. I'm not your policeman, basically. That's what he's saying. And so he's, he said to Abu Basir, what a power, and he, it's a famous phrase uh, that Mish'al Harbin Waylu Ummihi Musa'iru Harbin Lawkana Indahu Rijal that it basically translates as your mother would be proud of the army you can raise if you had an army to raise, if you had people to help you, right? And it basically, you would be a mighty warrior if you had people around you. Or you would cause a great amount of you know, pain or victory or whatnot if you had a helper, meaning I cannot help you. That's an indirect way of saying I cannot help you. So Abu Basir got the point and he then fled Medina on his own to go find refuge in an oasis outside of Mecca and the news spread that Abu Basir is in that oasis. And so Abu Jandal escaped again and teamed up with his friend Abu Basir. And one by one, all of the mustada'afin, all of the secret Muslims, 70 in number, they fled, but they cannot go to Medina. So they went to that oasis. And that oasis became the refuge center where the 70 would then harass the Quraysh, attack their caravans, until finally Abu Sufyan himself sent a message to the Prophet ﷺ, please, for the love of God, take these 70 and put them back in Medina. See, that needed to happen, or else those 70 would not have gotten permission to get to Medina. That, the, the whole qadr of Allah, of Abu, Basi, of Abu Jandal, excuse me, the whole Abu Jandal issue was meant to save those 70. Because if that hadn't happened, then Abu Sufyan would never have said, please, just take them. Otherwise, they would not have had that way out. 
And so as Allah's qadr works in his, in his ways beyond our knowledge. So the point is that uh, this is the story of, of, of the Hudaybiyah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in the Quran a verse that Ibn Ishaq says is a reference to Suhail ibn Amr. Allah says in the Quran, Surah Al-Fatih, Allah says, إِذْ جَعَلِ الَّذِينَ كَفْرُوا فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ وَالْحَمِيَّةَ حَمِيَّةَ الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ Recall when the people of Kufr, their hearts were filled with the Hamiya. And Hamiya is basically, there's no one English word for it, but it basically means a pride of Jahiliya. It's literally Hamiyyat al-Jahiliya. It's basically our version of extreme nationalism or fascism or pride in one's ancestors, right? I am this and you are that. This is Hamiya. It's a type of uh, bigoted partisanship. It's a type of, 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 of backwardness. Racism is a type of Hamiya. Okay? Or being proud of one's ancestry is Hamiya. And so Allah says, remember when those people, some of them, their hearts were filled with a Hamiya, like the Hamiya of Jahiliya. Ibn Ishaq said, this ayah was revealed for Suhail ibn Amr. When he refused to write Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, and he wrote Bismik Allahum. Because what's wrong with Bismillah ar-Rahim? He could have done that. But it's just a matter of my people and your people, and my faith and your faith. So look, this is an ayah revealed against Suhail. But Allah's qadr is that eventually Suhail will convert to Islam. And uh, two years later in the conquest of Mecca, al Dhahabi reports that when the Prophet ﷺ was entering Mecca, he said, four are the people, I consider them to be free of shirk. Four are the people, I'm hopeful for them before entering Mecca. Itab ibn Usaid, Jubayd ibn Mut'im, the son of Mut'im ibn Ali, Jubayd ibn Mut'im, Hakim ibn Hizam, um, we have not done Hakim ibn Hizam, we will do Hakim ibn Hizam, inshallah. we have not done him, right? We have not done him, anybody remember? Because even I'm forgetting whom we've done, can you believe that? I'm forgetting myself. I don't think we've done Hakim ibn Hizam. He's a very interesting uh, Sahabi, and he's also uh, uh, the only Sahabi to have been born inside of the Kaaba, authentically, uh, yani the, the, who was born inside the Kaaba, the only human being the only human being to be born inside the Kaaba uh, in the history of the Kaaba. No other person was born inside the Kaaba. And many other things about Hakim ibn Hizam. Um, uh, and Hakim ibn Hizam, uh, he said, and so the third is Hakim ibn Hizam. And then the final one, he says, Suhail ibn Amr. Four are the people I'm hopeful for. Okay, and the fourth one, Suhail ibn Amr. And this is again a great honor for Suhail ibn Amr. And the army marches in, as you know, and the Prophet divided the group into three. He was in the middle, and Khalid ibn al Walid uh, was leading on the right flank. And uh, uh, um, there was a, a left flank as well. And Khalid ibn al Walid was the only flank to catch some battle, some minor skirmishes took place. Some of the final chieftains of the Quraysh refused to give up so easily. And amongst them were Abu Sufyan and Suhail ibn Amr. They were of the very few who actually gathered together a group and fought with swords when Mecca was being conquered. Some blood was shed. Maybe five people's lives were lost. Very few. It's a very minor thing in the end of the to conquer Mecca. And a handful of people lost really is a peaceful conquering. But there was one skirmish, just one skirmish. And who's leading that skirmish? Abu Sufyan and Suhaid ibn Amr. And this again, the reason being, is very obvious here, they are the leaders. And the leader does not surrender. The leader, it's a matter of ego and pride for your own leadership. Like you have to just die. If you're going to die, like you go ahead and die, right? So Abu Sufyan and Suhaid ibn Amr, they gathered whatever they could, and they were the only group to physically fight against the Muslims in the conquest of Mecca. And Khalid ibn Walid dealt them a very severe blow. A few of their party members were killed. And when they realized that all hope is lost, they then fled for their lives. And Suhail returned back to his house and sent a message to his son, Abdullah, to come immediately. Abdullah the Muslim. So Abdullah, somehow the message gets to him, and he comes, and Suhail then says, finally he agrees to surrender. And he says, can you go and seek protection for me by name? Because he is not a regular Qurashi. He is of the elite. So he says to his son, go to the Prophet ﷺ and see if you can get protection for me. So he's, now he's agreed. After the battle is lost, now he's agreed to basically surrender, not to accept Islam. 
to surrender if my life is protected. And so Abdullah goes to the Prophet ﷺ and gets a exception. As you know, when the conquest took place, six were the people who were not forgiven. And even of those six, three were forgiven. So only three people were actually executed at the conquest of Mecca. Everybody was forgiven. And so Suhail was also forgiven by name. And uh, that was when the Prophet ﷺ then called all of the Quraysh in front of the Kaaba, as you know. This was the famous uh, incident where uh, before the Salat al-Dhuhr, basically, it's the, the sun is coming up, and uh, all of the Quraysh gathered in front of the Kaaba, and this was when the Prophet ﷺ stood in, on the door of the Kaaba, and he said that, uh, what do you presume I should do with you? What do you think I should do with you? Right? And there was dead silence. Who's going to speak? What's going to be said? Until finally, Suhail ibn Amr stood up. And again, this demonstrates many things. His nobility and his intelligence and even his confidence in himself to be the one who stands up at this time when everybody is quiet. Even Abu Sufyan didn't say anything. Nothing. Dead silence. It is Suhail who stands up and he gives that eloquent response and again shows you he is the khatib. That's why he's the khatib of the Quraysh. That eloquent response. We think good and we say good. You are Akhun Karim wa Ibn Akhin Karim. It's one phrase, but it's powerful. What do you think I'm going to do to you? Silence. Suhail stands up after a while. We think you're going to do good, and we say you're going to do good. You are an Akhun Karim, and you are the son of an Akhun Karim. Your father, we knew him. Your grandfather, we knew him. You're one of us. Of course you're going to do good to us. And what a powerful, brave thing to say. And, of course, he was correct in that. That's when the Prophet ﷺ said, You know, go for your all free. I'm not going to harm you. I'm not going to enslave you. I'm not going to kill you. Your lives, your properties, all of this is yours. Nothing will happen to you. You are free. And that's why that batch is called Tulaqa. And that is the lowest batch of Sahaba. The highest batch are the 10, then the Badriyun, then, 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 then. And the lowest batch of the Sahaba are the Muslima to Fathi Makkah or the Turaqa. The very last batch that accepted. And this is the batch of Suhail. This is the batch of Suhail. And Suhail just gets that honor of being a Sahabi. But from that batch of Turaqa, he is definitely of the highest. Why? We will come to now. So it was at this point in time when Suhail, perhaps grudgingly, we don't know. Definitely Abu Sufyan grudgingly accepted Islam. Definitely. Definitely uh, um, so many of the other uh, leaders of the Quraysh, um, Al-Hakam ibn As, the father of Marwan, grudgingly accepted Islam. Right? The Banu Umayyah. So the Banu Makhzum chieftains, the Banu Umayyah chieftains, very grudgingly. They are not really into it right now. So hey, we don't know, did he do it grudgingly or willingly? At this point in time, we do not know. But within a few weeks, the conquest of Hunayn takes place. And what happened after Hunayn? Who remembers Hunayn? What was the famous thing of Hunayn? After Hunayn, what happened? The amount of booty in Hunayn was more than any other battle. Right? It was... It was insurmountable, uncountable wealth was Allah blessed the Prophet ﷺ, right after the conquest of Mecca with the equivalent of يعني, like a billion dollars let's say. I mean just an inconceivable amount for our times and even for that time. And with that amount of wealth and the conquest of Mecca is fresh like literally a few weeks. These are brand new. So the Prophet ﷺ made a small list of people instantaneous multimillionaires instantaneously a small list they were made multimillionaires number one amongst them is Abu Sufyan we're going to come to Abu Sufyan's biography that's a very interesting biography too number one Abu Sufyan by the way Muawiyah also got a hundred camels a hundred camels is like a multimillionaire yani, remember our process did not even have a camel until the hijrah having a camel was basically the beginning of upper middle class. 
This is the beginning of upper middle class. Middle and lower middle, you don't even have a camel. You're in the city, you're not going anywhere, you're fine, you're living that way. So he didn't even have a camel until the hijrah when he purchased it with his men, as you know. To get a hundred camels, this is literally as if somebody's writing you a check for like, I don't know, five million dollars, something like this. An amount that is just, this is, a, you are now in the top one percent. And to get that instantaneously, literally, and only a small group. By the way, this was not given to every, every Qurayshi, obviously. Obviously. It's given to a handful. Five, six, seven people. And of them is Suhail ibn Amr. He gets the 100 camel. There were many who got five camels, ten sheep. The whole long list is there. But the 100 camel is the highest category. And in that category, you have Abu Sufyan and Muawiyah and Suhail ibn Amr and a few other people. Hakim ibn Hizam was one of them. A few people, you have 100 camels. And this was when more and more Iman is coming in. Now, I've spoken about this many times in the past. The issue of incentivizing conversion. The issue of giving all of this money or wealth or power or prestige and wanting them to convert to Islam. And I have said that some of us might find this problematic. But the psychology, the paradigm is very different and very simple. And there's nothing problematic about it whatsoever. Nothing problematic whatsoever. The fact of the matter is we need to begin with the premise that Islam is true. If it is true, then you want people to embrace it by whatever means is legitimate. The example I can give is that suppose somebody is sick and he does not want to take the medicine. Okay, in fact, maybe they don't even know they're sick and they don't want to take the medicine. Whatever incentive you give to get the medicine into their body, it's all permissible. Once they recognize the power of the medicine, they will appreciate it. But if you have to bribe, if you have to, you know, whatever is legitimate because there's no trickery allowed, okay? By, when I say bribed, I don't mean bribe like to get somebody out of, of their haq. By bribe, I mean incentivize, gift. That's a better word, okay? Whatever mechanism you need to use to push somebody to take that medicine, as long as it's legit and there's no trickery, we're not concerned with that. Why? Because once they taste the medicine and the sickness begins to be cured, they themselves will appreciate the power of the medicine. And that's why so many times the issue of jizya, for example, right? Uh, and the issue of the slave who's a non-Muslim converting to Islam for the sake of being freed. All of these are incentives. The Sharia has 101 perks for non-Muslims to embrace Islam when you're living in a land of Islam. So many things that are meant to be conducive to embrace Islam. And this is politically you know, incorrect. Like, why would they do that? Do you think they, they need to be bribed? No, it's not a matter of bribery in a negative way. It's a matter of they don't even know what they're missing. If they can just taste it, that's all they need to do. They'll appreciate it. And this is what happened with Suhail ibn Amr and the others at the time as well. Uh, that uh, many amongst them, that bribery or that incentivizing, it proved to them that Islam is true. As one of the chieftains, Al-Aqra ibn Habiz, as he went back and he said to his people, O oh my people, embrace Islam, for wallahi, no king of this world can be as generous as what a prophet has just been. Like he recognized, this is not the generosity of a king. To give a hundred, Al-Aqra got a hundred camels as well. To get a hundred camels in one go, literally stroke of a pen, and you take all of this. This isn't, kings don't do that. This is not somebody who wants the wealth for himself. This must be a prophet. Can you believe the generosity convinced Al-Aqra that the Rasul is the Rasul? That's all they needed, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So for Sufyan and I mean, for Suhail and others, all of this is now basically incentivizing this. And Suhail decided to remain in Mecca. He did not migrate to Medina. Remember, after the conquest, there was no migration. The migration is not obligatory. You don't have to migrate to Medina. So Suhail loved his city and he remained in uh, Mecca. Uh, for the next two years and it was at that point in time when the news of the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reached them in Mecca and some of those who had grudgingly converted talk began to now go back to the old days these are the Turaqa right their Iman is weak many of them because again there must be, have been at least a thousand people who converted of Mecca the rem remnants of Mecca are now converting and not all of them have embraced Islam 
from the faith, from Iman. And so talk begins to go back, murmuring, resentment. And the crowds begin to gather at the Kaaba. And we all know the confusion and the chaos that's taking place in Medina right now. We all know the state of shock they're in in Medina. But Medina has Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali. Medina has Bilal. Medina has all of our mothers. Medina has Medina. Who does Mecca have? No one to that stature. No one. On top of that, Mecca has a lot of these tulaqa who want to go back to status quo. And that talk and murmur begins to grow until finally the governor, uh, Utab ibn Usaid, whom the Prophet had appointed as the governor. So this was the governor of Mecca, appointed by the Prophet. Utab himself started fearing for his life. I'm going to be killed. These people are going to kill me. And he disappeared and went into hiding because he felt his own life was in danger because of all of the growing discontent of going back to the good old days or whatever, you know. And it was at that point in time when the prediction of the Prophet to Umar is going to come true. Leave him, for perhaps he will say something one day that will make you happy. This was the moment that Allah Azza wa had wanted for Suhail to redeem himself. Now he is the senior most Qurashi alive from the good old days. I'm saying good old days, you're being sarcastic. His good old days, or their good old days, right? This is the real bad old days, right? But from those people that are murmuring, they want the old days. Suhail is Suhail. And his voice is not like the voice of these youngsters. Suhail stood up in front of the Kaaba. And he gave a khutbah. Unfortunately, it is not recorded in detail. It just says that he gave a moving sermon. That's all that we find here, unfortunately. But you can imagine the khatib of the Quraysh now has to become the khatib on behalf of Islam in Mecca. He gave them a khutbah and he used the phrase of Abu Bakr in Medina. He quoted it and he used it in Mecca. مَنْ كَانَ يَعْبُدُ مُحَمَّدًا فَإِنَّ مُحَمَّدًا قَدْ مَاتْ وَمَنْ كَانَ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ حَيٌّ لَا يَمُوتْ This is that famous phrase that Abu Bakr used. He becomes, if you like, the Abu Bakr equivalent now in Mecca. And in front of the Kaaba, he utters those phrases. That even if the Prophet has died, Islam has not died, and Allah Azza wa will never die. And it was his khutbah that stirred in the people, whatever iman that was there. And so alhamdulillah, they consolidated and the governor managed to now come back and basically reclaim order. It was therefore Suhail ibn Amr who by the help of Allah saved the day. And this was again the uh, point of yani, what the Prophet has said to him. And uh, his son Abdullah uh, was in Medina at the time. And he participated in the battles of Abu Bakr and he passed away the next year, the 12th year of the Hijrah, fighting against uh, uh, Musaylam al kadhab in the battle of Yamama. And Abu Jandal as well, he became a Mujahid after, uh, uh, in the days of Abu Bakr and Umar. And he too died fighting the Romans in Syria. And the both of them died without children. And so he witnessed or he knew or he heard of this death of his children in his own lifetime. And because they died without children, so he as well would then die without any family. So he did not have any family after that. Khalas, his lineage came to an end. And uh, after the death of the Prophet wasallam, he made a promise to himself, even though he loved Mecca, because he was of the, it is his city. He's the leader of the city, one of the leaders. And he even did not live in Medina. He only lived in Mecca. And he made a promise to himself. And the people around him heard it. He goes, I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, say that for one of you to stand one hour of your life in the path of Allah, it is better than all of a lifetime of deeds if you are with your family. So I shall remain in the battlefield until I die and I shall never return to Mecca. So after the death of the Prophet sallallahu he made a promise that I'm always going to be fighting in the jihad against the Romans and the, you know, the, the other people until my death comes to me. And he said, I swear by Allah, 
for every time I have stood with the mushriks against the Muslims, for every time I will now stand with the Muslims against their enemies. And for every penny that I spent with the mushriks against the Muslims, I will now spend for Islam to defend against its enemies. Perhaps Allah will use my later affairs to forgive my earlier ones. This indicates Suhail's Islam became 100% genuine. We see this, that's what Imam Shafi'i said, as I quoted in the beginning, and Imam Ahmad, that as soon as Suhail embraced Islam, his Islam remained praiseworthy. It wasn't so-and-so. He began his Islam genuinely from the uh, conversion. And one of his most profound comments, uh, which really shows his Iman, and it's recorded in multiple books of history, uh, really shows his level of Iman and Yaqeen, was that at one point in time, after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi a delegation of the Quraysh, including Abu Sufyan, they had to visit Umar for some affairs, some issues, whatnot. So Suhail ibn Amr, Abu Sufyan, and some of the old school, old guard, they travel from Mecca to Medina to get some, you know, whatever was needed from Umar ibn al-Khattab. And when they got there, they found a long line outside because he had office hours. He has office hours at the time. And... It was the custom of Umar ibn al-Khattab to treat people or deal with them in accordance with when they had embraced Islam. In accordance with when they had embraced Islam. And therefore, if there's 10 people outside, the first person to be given audience would be the earliest converts. And it so happened that that day outside the door of Umar ibn al-Khattab were people like Bilal, and some of the other earlier converts that were not from the Quraysh. And Abu Sufyan, along with his companions, began grumbling when they saw Bilal and others allowed in, and everybody is going in, and they were the last batch to get the audience with Umar ibn al-Khattab. Think about that. Abu Sufyan is not given priority over Bilal. Think about that. And Abu Sufyan feels it, and he grumbles, and he mutters, and he's frustrated. And it was at this point that Suhail turned to them, his own batch, because he is with that batch, right? The last batch. And he says, rather than getting angry at them, you should be angry at yourselves. The same people that went in, they were invited to Islam at the same time as us. And they hastened to accept it. But you delayed and stayed behind. So then, what do you think will happen when the doors of Jannah are opened and people are called into Jannah? This is what you call Iman. Like what a slap on the face. And what a sense of fear for himself. You're getting angry at them. But we were invited to Islam all at the same time. And they did accept before us. So why are you angry at them? Be angry at yourself. And then you're irritated at this door. How about the door of Jannah? What were you going to do if Allah forbid you are delayed from entering that because you were delayed here? SubhanAllah, what a sense of Iman coming from Suhail, right? And yani, Wallah, you hear this and you're like, SubhanAllah, what a powerful yani, you know, um, uh, feeling of, of, of genuine regret of having embraced Islam so late and wanting to make up for that. And uh, this was the last time he was seen in Mecca and Medina. After this, he went and, and became a mujahid. As we said, he fought against the Romans, and he continued fighting uh, in Syria against the Romans until the plague broke out in the year 18 of the Hijrah called the Amwas Plague. And the Amwas Plague took many, many of the Sahaba, and his children had already died, as we mentioned before. Both of his sons had died. Uh, one of them in the 12th year, the other one right before him in, Sh in Sham in Syria. And so he saw both of his sons or heard both of his sons die in his own lifetime. And then he passed away in the 18th year of the Hijrah, the last of his family. He does not have any family after that. And uh, that is the story of Suhaid ibn Amr, a very, very interesting story. And one that, again, you look at these snippets from specific time frames. You know, if Allah had willed, even, for example, in the, in the conquest of Mecca, when some of his colleagues died, if Allah had willed him to die, he would have died. And that would be the, been the end of him. And, but 
Allah Azza wa Jal decides who is going to and who is not going to. And there are people whom, you know, they have done in their lives. I mean, he's torturing his own sons to protect his dynasty. And again, this is not to excuse him, but from his faith tradition, from his feeling, he wants to protect his family. And he is loving his family. That harshness is not meant to kill his sons. It's meant to bring him back, them back to his way. That's what he wants to do. But in the end, he realizes what is true. And his sons both die shaheed in his own lifetime. And then he eventually dies a shaheed as well. So Suhail ibn Amr is one of the noble companions, uh, uh, the noble enemies who became one of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And with that, inshallah ta'ala, we come to the conclusion of Suhail. And then next week we will continue. Uh, maybe we'll do one of the other noble companions. Or maybe we'll do, as we had mentioned in the beginning, some of the Sahaba are left. We'll see who is left, inshallah. Any quick questions for today for Suhail ibn Amr? Anything from Suhail ibn Amr? Any hadith from Suhail ibn Amr? No, none. Because he... Uh, his both of his sons passed away very early and he himself passed away in the time of Umar ibn Khattab uh, none that I'm aware of I looked up uh, he is mentioned in the hadith as a character but he did not narrate hadith Okay, he is mentioned other people mentioned Suhail but he himself did not narrate hadith and um, as uh, I looked up the six books and Imam Ahmed's Musnad if there's anything beyond this which I really doubt because I looked up a number of books um, but uh, no he did not okay Fadda Sheikh Abu Sufyan, yes, but not Suhail ibn Amr. Right. So, then we got one of the people that helped. Can you mention them? Wallahi, that is a very interesting point because it is mentioned. I read this today that Abu Sufyan fought, and, it, and in one of the books, it's not in this one. Exactly. You know what? I have to go back because. Exactly, exactly. I, you know, you're absolutely right. And yet, literally two hours ago, in one of the books, it mentioned Abu Sufyan. And it could be, a, it should be a mistake then. Yeah. No, no, that, that's definitely a valid point. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely a valid point. So it could be, it could be that the book that I, uh, I'm quoting from didn't say Ikrima, it said Abu Sufyan. Okay, uh, it could be. Suhail went into hiding and, and got his son to get the aman. Yeah, so Ikrima, we will do his story, inshallah, in two weeks, inshallah. I already have I already have Ikrima in the slot, by the way. He will be one of those interesting stories. Yes. So I will go back and look because I am right now 100% sure that in one of the books I read, his name was there. But you are absolutely right. It doesn't make any sense. And not only that, but... He technically converted right before, right before the Fatih. So you're right, that is a mistake. Jazakallah khair. Other questions or comments? Okay, so inshallah with that we will finish for today and then continue next Wednesday inshallah ta'ala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.